Howdy. Howdy. How is everyone this morning? Good. Are we trying to be well with all the allergies going around and congestion? I told Megan, I was like, I'm trying to strive through this without getting sick as everyone's sniffling and has headaches and whatnot. So I hope you're all excited about today as much as I am. We are talking about chronic disease prevention and management. And I just wanted to thank you all for coming today and taking time out of y'all's schedules to be with us personal, in person and through TTVN. We hope that you get something out of today as well as these next coming nutrition presentations. Next week we are having nutrition through the life cycle, so hope to see you all there again. And if y'all have any questions, please ask Megan or Courtney after the session. And don't forget to sign in. And I'm going to give it to Megan. So help me welcome Megan, registered dietitian from Butyl. All right. Um, thank you. And howdy. Howdy. Um, you'll have to bear with me, too. I got this whole congestion thing going on. And um, so if I start choking, it's nothing major. Just I'll get a cough drop and we'll be good to go. Um, so I'm excited to be here. I see many familiar faces from the last presentation. But this one is going to really focus on chronic disease management. Um, as I was driving over here, I was thinking, okay, the presentation is a little bit more generalized for each disease process. So I just want to give the disclaimer. If you do have one of these conditions or a family member who has one of these as we go through them, please remember to consult with your own dietitian and um, physician because there are going to be some things that this is more generalized to. Um, and your eating pattern or your recommendation from your physician may be a little bit different. Um, so always take that into consideration. I'm happy to answer any questions as we go throughout this as well. Um, we're a nice um, tight group here, so please ask. Don't wait till the end because I want to make sure your questions get answered. We're going to go through some major disease processes that are influenced by nutrition. And so when I say influenced by nutrition, this is really where diet plays a big part in not only prevention, but also maybe even the outcome if we do have that condition. So um, feel free to ask as we are diving into this. Um, so nutrition has an impact on any type of prevention of these chronic diseases, but in particular, it can help with risk and complications, side effects, medical management, that type of thing. Um, and for an example, we'll get through diabetes here um, as we go throughout, but I had a physician come down yesterday and he said, Megan, I just have this remarkable story to tell you. Um, one of my patients was on insulin or some sort of glucose um, regimen to manage his insulin levels, and um, he lost a significant amount of weight just through diet, exercise. This is just a regular student, graduate student, um, now is decreasing his dosage to half and then eventually hoping to get off of the medication just from diet and lifestyle. So there was no quick fix. There was no specific change he was doing, but I think it's just remarkable to see that not only should we take this into account to be preventative with our health, but also reactive if we do have these conditions or a family member or friend who does. So these are the ones we're going to talk through. We're going to talk through cardiovascular disease, heart disease in general. Um, diabetes is a big one. That's nutrition influenced here. Um, high cholesterol, which links to some cardiovascular disease, but I'll give you a little bit of the research behind that. Um, gastrointestinal diseases, I may refer to those as GI diseases, so if you hear that, that's going to be the same. Um, irritable bowel syndrome, a lot of just gastrointestinal issues that we see or that I see a lot of um, can be diet influenced, can be stress influenced as well, but we're seeing both of those here. And then lastly, eating disorders, and I threw that one in here. Um, some of you may go, okay, yeah, that's great, but I don't really, that's more younger people or younger population. And while I see a ton of it here on campus, um, it is something that we need to be more aware of. Just as adults, even in our own eating patterns and populations, um, the very last presentation I'll do in this series is talking about mindful eating. And a lot of what I do with my eating disorder patients is mindful eating. And some of you may find some correlations in yourself. While you may not feel like you have a true eating disorder, there are disordered eating patterns. Um, that we want to address here. So I'll talk through each of those. Um, but let's talk through cardiovascular disease. What are um, some foods or what are some things that you may have seen or heard of that would be beneficial for prevention of cardiovascular disease or even treatment? What are your thoughts there? Fish oil. Fish oil, yes. What else? 
CoQ10 supplements. So we're talking a little bit of supplements here. What else? Cheerios. Cheerios, whole grains, <laughs> cholesterol, <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Anything else? Fish. Fish? Yes. Yeah, so in general, when we think of cardiovascular disease, heart disease in general is an inflammation process. Um, so what I like to think of just in basic terms is if we think of an inflammatory response, we want something that's going to calm the inflammation down. Um, if you think a lot in the media and social media right now, we hear sodium and we hear sugar and we hear fats and unhealthy fats. Those are all things that cause more inflammation. And if we think of inflammation, think of it as we get a cut, it gets red, it gets swollen, it gets itchy. That's what is exactly going on inside of us when we put the wrong things in. So with cardiovascular disease, it's a result of problems related to atherosclerosis, which is hardening of the um, arteries and buildup of those arteries, and that blockage by plaque. And we'll talk through cholesterol as this links to this. Um, it can decrease or completely prevent blockage or passage of blood through the artery, hence heart attack or stroke. So stroke and heart attack kind of are interrelated here when we're talking about diet and overall risk factors. Um, so some of you have kind of mentioned this a little bit. Um, in the last presentation, we talked about magnesium increasing the blood flow, opening the blood vessels. So really that's what we want here. We want foods that are going to provide an opening increase the flow, decrease the blood pressure, and strain on the heart. Um, because what I like to think of is if we have, um, say for example, you have a water hose and it's kinked, the amount that comes out the end is pretty slow and it's hard. There's a lot of pressure building up and it's pressure, 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 but the volume out is slow. And that's what happens when our arteries are built up with plaque. There's a lot of pressure going through there, but the flow is small and that can cause damage to our heart, and that's what causes lack of oxygen to the brain as well. Um, so what we want to limit, some of you have mentioned this already, but are saturated and trans fats. Saturated or fats are really anything that comes from an animal. That would be chicken on the skin on chicken, the fat around steak, high fat dairy, that's all saturated fat. Trans fats are a man-made type fat that was several years ago, very popular to help things stay shelf stable, to help baked goods stay great on the shelf. Um, we're seeing less and less of that in products, but it's still there. So we wanna make sure we're looking at those labels. Um, I mentioned high fat meats. When we look at high fat meats, anything with loin in the name means leaner. So anything that has ribeye or um, more of that marbling or fat content, that's what we wanna avoid. Sweets and sugar sweetened beverages, so here again the inflammation, more of that artificial or um, sugar that we're adding to our foods instead of the natural form in fruits, that's something we want to minimize. <coughs> I throw this in here too um, because a lot of research has come about about tropical oils, coconut oils, palm oils, and there's conflicting research around coconut oil and heart disease. And what they're showing is, and without going into a big scientific explanation, is that coconut oil has medium chain triglycerides, MCTs. And so this is showing to be beneficial for heart disease in some regard. But there's also, at the end of the day, coconut oil is still a saturated fat. It comes from a tropical <coughs> oil. So I'm a lot more cautious with recommending that to patients. Um, I'm no cardiologist, so I don't know exactly what their opinions are on that. But just from a safety standpoint, I wouldn't go crazy with coconut oil if there is some sort of um, heart disease risk factor or effect there. Um, and certainly we want to reduce sodium to below 2300 milligrams per day. That's about two teaspoons. That's not a whole lot of salt when we think about in our total diet. Salt here again raises blood pressure. If we want our blood pressure to be normalized and not a lot shooting through that blood vessel, we want to look at that here. Okay, um, so high sodium foods, I'll let you kind of read these. Some of these you go, yeah, okay, I know that. Um, but how do we reduce sodium in our foods? What I suggest a lot of times is cook your own foods at home. One, because you can control it. Um, two, you're able to add what you want, seasonings and flavorings without added sodium that you're getting a lot from restaurants or out to eat. Um, your processed and packaged foods aren't horrible, but know that if you are going to choose that, maybe supplement with just a bag of steamed vegetables or a piece of fruit 
or just steamed rice that doesn't have a lot of flavorings or salt added to that. Um, so you can see these here. We can certainly add herbs and spices to our foods. Things don't have to taste bland or terrible, um, but we don't need an excess amount of sodium, more than 2,300 milligrams. So our top heart healthy foods, some of you have mentioned these already. Um, we think about our fish, salmon being one of those for our fish oil and our oils, healthy fats, walnut, walnuts in particular too. Walnuts have a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, so if we don't like fish or we don't want to consume it often, <coughs> um, your walnuts are great for that. Raspberries, really any berries, are excellent here. <coughs> Our fat-free or low-fat yogurt, here again, the low-fat dairy is going to help with the inflammation. Chickpeas, beans, nuts, seeds. Oatmeal, we mentioned Cheerios, that's going to be that whole grain here again. And then our olive oil would be a great healthy fat instead of things like coconut oil and that type of thing. <coughs> Questions on our cardiovascular here. <coughs> Any of these certain foods surprise you or kind of about what you were thinking? Okay. Um, this is just more resources. So say you have a loved one who has heart disease. Say you're concerned. Yes. So, uh, so babies, so you like a when you buy berries or berries or pesticides, how do you need to control or buy not? I don't. Yeah, great question. So she asked about berries in particular, pesticide content, and should we be mindful of that or be aware of that? Um, so with our berries, they're more porous, so the, the ability to get pesticides on them is a little bit easier because they don't have a thick skin. We don't peel it, we don't scrub it real difficult or hardly when we um, clean it. So with our berries, if you want to buy organic, you certainly can. Um, nutritionally, there's no difference. As long as you're washing your berries, you're okay to do that. And your frozen is just fine too. Organic ones, so I'm sorry. Organic ones, so can we trust or? As far as nutrition or health? No. Nutrition, so this label organic. Yes, okay. So she asked, um, organic, can we trust that label? Absolutely. If it has an organic label on it, it has been approved by the government. A, an inspector has gone to that berry farm and looked at the soil, tested it, made sure they're using organic products. <coughs> Things like the term natural are not regulated like organic. So organic, if it says certified organic, it's usually a circle um, that says certified organic and usually... Um, it depends on the color, but usually it's green and brown. Um, that is a certified organic product, and you should be able to trust that it is organic there, yes. I'm sorry, I missed No, that's okay. So, the berries, you said, how do you... So, berries, um, would I choose organic or not? Nutritionally, there's no difference. So, me personally, I buy just the conventionally grown products and wash them well. Um, with your organic berries, if you're really concerned about pesticides or that bothers you in particular, then your berries buying organic berries would be reasonable and appropriate. But nutritionally, there's no difference. They're not going to make an impact on heart disease one way or the other. They're both berries at the end of the day. So um, they're both going to provide great anti-inflammatory response there. That answer your question? So cancer and other things we don't... They don't affect for a long term like Just in general, yeah. So their berries are great for any type of disease process. It's inflammation, remember? So any type of inflammatory disease, whether it's cardiovascular disease, whether it's cancer, whether it's um, diabetes, it's all going to help with lowering a little bit of that inflammation. So they're great for a number of things. They're just mainly listed here for the cardiovascular. Okay. All right. Um, so more resources on specifically if you have um, exact needs on cardiovascular disease. Great resource, great website. Because I get this a lot um, from my patients of, well, where do I go for credible information? I find lots of misleading information or conflicting information online. So great resource here. Okay, um, the diet that I recommend, we talked about healthier eating patterns or healthy foods for heart disease, but the diet that I would recommend here is called the DASH diet, uh, Dietary Approaches to Stop Hypertension. 
Um, this was really created to help with hypertension, which is high blood pressure, um, but it's great for cardiovascular disease, and it's really a great eating pattern for just the general population, someone with or without heart disease. Um, so as you can see, it's rich in fruits, vegetables, low-fat or non-fat dairy, whole grains, lean meats, fish, poultry, nuts, and beans, so it doesn't exclude any specific food group. Um, it's high in fiber and low to moderate fat, so the <coughs> high fiber is helping with our heart disease. And the goal is to really lower blood pressure and lower cholesterol. But like I said, if you just want a healthier eating pattern, if you look up a, the DASH diet, it's a great pattern to follow. It's similar to a kind of Mediterranean type diet if you've heard of that before too. Um, so our top DASH diet foods, I'll let you kind of read through these here again. But here again, we're looking at our lean meats, our whole grains, our lots of fruits, lots of vegetables, our healthy fats. So that would be our nuts, our seeds, our oils, those types of things are really what we're looking at here um, as just a healthy eating pattern for cardiovascular disease or just general health. Okay, questions? Yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, as far as antioxidants, yes. does that also help with the heart? I mean, yes, ma'am. I hear a lot of stuff about like pomegranate juice mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. blueberries. Or yeah, whatever. so antioxidants, what that means, um, our body is constantly producing oxidation, if you will. And so it's free radicals that are floating around. And anytime we can put an antioxidant in that helps with inflammation in particular, um, berries, nuts, seeds, all of our fruits and vegetables are great for that. It really helps to prevent the free radicals from continuing to develop and getting out of control is what it does. So our antioxidants are great really for any disease process and any healthy American, but for cardiovascular disease in particular, it's excellent for that. Yeah, sure. Question. I had heard somewhere about something that's really high in fiber, it kind of takes away from some of the, the fats. Is that, is that? It yeah. depends on I mean, what it is. It's really high, like in excess in fiber, that it kind of takes away some of the bad stuff. I, I heard. I, yeah, so we'll look at that with cholesterol okay. here. And you're exactly, you're, you're right on target. Higher fiber foods, it was mentioned like Cheerios, oats, that type mm -hmm. of thing, helps to remove some of the cholesterol okay. out. And we're going to get to that. Yeah, so if I don't answer it at cholesterol, let me know. Okay? All right, um, so let's look at diabetes here. Um, as I mentioned, everyone is so individualized, but I just want to give a quick overview of what diabetes is. Um, so in our bodies, normal response each one of you here that doesn't have diabetes we have a pancreas that produces insulin and insulin is a hormone just like estrogen testosterone androgen that's produced and circulating in our body but it produces an effect or a response to the amount of glucose coming in glucose being carbohydrate okay so um, in a normal person it's produced regularly when we eat carbohydrate it produces when we don't it's not as um, common or not produced but for someone who has a little bit higher blood sugar levels, means they may be more pre-diabetic. So insulin's working, but maybe not as efficient or not as appropriately as it should. Okay, our risk for cardiovascular disease and further diabetes is occurring here. Type 1 diabetes, uh, for those of you who don't, who don't know, this is more um, what you may hear, hear of as juvenile onset or um, early onset, usually kids will develop this. This is a hereditary genetic component. It's an autoimmune disease. They are required to have insulin the rest of their life because the pancreas is attacking itself. Eventually, it doesn't produce any insulin at all. So most of our older Americans who are diagnosed with diabetes are going to have type 2, where insulin works and now it's not working as properly. And usually that's the diet and lifestyle influence. Um, our type one, I see a lot of those on campus here in our, our college population. Some of them recently diagnosed, some diagnosed when they were four years old. So we'll see a little bit more of that in the younger generation, but as we get older, usually the diagnosis would be a type two because of overweight, diet, lifestyle, that type of thing. So we produce insulin in type two, just the body just doesn't use it very well. And so that's when we have to go into some um, medical management. So I'll focus more on type two here. If you have a type one question, I'm happy to answer that too. Um, gestational diabetes two is really more seen in pregnant women who were not previously diabetic. Usually it's more short term in that pregnancy period. 
So nutrition and diabetes here, some of you may have heard this already too. We certainly want to maintain an active lifestyle. Activity alone helps lower blood sugar. So if we have a problem with high blood sugar already, if we can increase the activity, it's gonna to help to normalize and level that. Um, some tips here to limit foods high in sugar. Really what I would suggest here are those added sugars. So anything coming outside of fruit and dairy, remember that fruits are natural sugar, dairy has lactose natural sugar, anything outside of that we wanna to try to limit. Regular meals and snacks is key for a diabetic. So if we think about whenever we ingest something, our insulin is having to produce, our pancreas produces insulin to manage that glucose that's coming in. So if we eat a large meal at one time, our insulin already has a hard time getting out and producing. So now we've made it even harder when we put a huge amount in at one time. So if we can space that out during the day, it helps tremendously. Um, this is where I would speak with someone particularly about how many carbs to eat each day, how much in a meal. If you have specific questions on that, I'm happy to answer that too. Um, less fat and salt. Here again, we kind of combine a little bit with the heart disease because if we have type 2 diabetes, our risk for heart disease increases again. So we want to make sure we're doing both of those. Limiting alcohol, a variety of foods, our saturated fats, which we've talked about, and including more whole grains. So if we have a glucose that we ingest, glucose being carbohydrate, if we ingest white bread, our blood sugar or glucose goes up and insulin has to figure that out. If we ingest whole grain bread or brown rice or Cheerios or oatmeal, our insulin response due to fiber or our glucose response due to fiber goes like this and it's so much easier for our body to process that. Um, the way I try to explain it to my students is if you think about a IV, if you're given an IV, it's a slow drip, right? So if we put in a whole grain, it's a slow breakdown. The fiber has to break down. Glucose slowly goes into our stream. Great. Insulin has an easier time working. But if we look at something like an injection, bam, it goes in. It's all the way in our body. That's like white bread or white pasta or white rice. It's all of a sudden surge. And now insulin is trying to figure out how to manage that. So we want a slow, steady drip. We want spread out over time. And we want those whole grains here. Um, so what do we want to look at here? Um, with our vegetables, we have starchy and non-starchy. So our starchy would be things that are going to have a little bit more of that carbohydrate, a little bit more of that glucose. That would be our potatoes, corn, peas. So certainly that's not out of the picture. We just don't want to eat it every single meal because that will count towards the glucose. Um, our fruits are great here again, but know that they do have carbohydrate. They do have sugar, so we want to be mindful of the portion. Um, our grains, I always encourage at least half whole grains. If you have a cultural preference to where brown rice is just not your thing, maybe it's mixing brown and white together. Maybe it's just having the white rice, but then choosing a whole grain at another meal. So we're trying to incorporate that as much as we can. And then protein. Certainly proteins are not going to increase our blood sugar. It's not going to change our insulin response. So these are great things that we could be adding to our diet regularly to help with that. Um, dairy or non-fat, low low-fat or non-fat yogurt, cheeses, milks are, are all great here again to help with that protein content. Okay, here are some specific resources too. Um, this is diabetes.org for more references, more information on diabetes. But does anyone have specific questions on that? Yes. The gentleman, or the, <coughs> the doctor that came down to see you. So the, the student had type 2? Yes, type 2. Because he was able to recover. Right. Type yes. one, he can't recover. Type one, you're going to be on insulin the rest of your life. Um, your pancreas just doesn't produce it, so to have quality of life, you have to be on that. But yes, ma'am, type two is what he changed his diet. He was overweight to begin with. Um, usually, where we get a type two diagnosis from is just sedentary lifestyle, not healthy eating patterns. Um, just by changing eating patterns and exercise <laughs> with weight loss, he reduced his medication in half. Now we're looking at changing it to no medication at all. So we can reverse type 2 diabetes, but it takes a strict healthy eating pattern and exercise long term. Yes. What about hypoglycemic? Yes. So hypoglycemic is changes in our blood sugar. Usually it means low blood sugar. Um, so with that, 
there's there's treatment for it in food really and so when we have low blood sugar some symptoms that many of you may even have on a regular basis or occasionally and not even realize it are the dizziness lightheaded um, my stomach is growling but i kind of feel like if i stand up i'd pass out um, just that low blood sugar effect you kind of see the little stars sometimes when you stand up um, and some people are more prone to it than others. Um, one being if we skip meals, if we wait too long in between meals. So when I say too long, more than three or four hours in between meals. If we don't, if we have a large amount of carbohydrates, say we have um, three slices of white bread, no protein, only bread. Well, we, the blood sugar goes up and then it bottoms out and this is hypoglycemic down here, very low blood sugar. Um, so in order to keep that steady, one, we have to eat regularly during the day. Two, we need to have carbohydrate, a healthy carbohydrate, complex, so fruit, vegetable, whole grain, and protein. So when we combine the protein with that, it helps to stabilize that blood sugar a little bit more. Um, also knowing too, some people that are more prone to hypoglycemic doesn't mean they have diabetes, doesn't mean they're more prone to diabetes, it just means that they maybe have um, a little bit more sensitive glucose response and insulin response. So we just have to be aware of that and know we have to eat regularly, carb and protein balance, um, and there's certain times a day where you may notice it more than others. It may be more mid-afternoon, it may be right when you get up and if you got in the shower right away, you feel faint and pass out. So we know we need to treat that a little bit more beforehand. Well, I was told that basically you followed the diabetic diet. Yeah, and it's a healthy eating pattern for most people, um, but there's no need to be restrictive per se. It's just a matter of we still eating regularly is probably the number one thing to do and combining the carb and protein together. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so, you know, I grew up, you know, fried everything and so it's hard to change your lifestyle sure just say that but if you don't and you have type 2 it will go into type 1 no so the no, question was I mean, if you have type 2 diabetes uh -huh. will it lead to type 1 no it will not um, okay. what happens though a lot of times so type 1 is on its own autoimmune you would know this is a hereditary genetic thing in your family usually. Now, not always, I see some that come in and no one in their family has it, but it's a very classic hereditary autoimmune condition. What type two does though, is we can start out being sensitive to, to insulin and glucose. We can be where we may need a little bit of insulin daily, a pill form. And if we don't manage it, what happens is now we're giving ourselves injections of insulin daily because we can't manage it with the pill form and we're not eating well and our, our diet is out of control. So it can progress to being worse. We can manage it with medication, diet, and lifestyle. We can manage it with just diet and lifestyle if we're really strict about it. But most patients will st start with like a metformin or a pill form of um, a way to manage our glucose and insulin and if we can stick to that and do well eating patterns we're good but it can go to that next level too like i said that our our pancreas just gets worn out and it can't keep working and so when we get to that point it's i don't want to say it's similar to type one but it's kind of that well our body doesn't have much coming out so we've got to give it something more and that's when it's the injections does that answer your questions okay thank you other questions yes ma'am can you explain more about uh, saturated fat impact on the diabetic? Why impact on the diabetic? Yeah, so just weight management in general. So when we think about um, over, being overweight or an unhealthy weight, if we have a lot of saturated fat in our diet, it doesn't help with weight management. So for those who are diabetic, we want to we don't want them to just lose all their weight but we want them to manage a healthy eating pattern and so when we can manage it through less saturated fat healthier eating overall we're going to see less long-term complications of that so mainly it's for a weight management concept not necessarily a heart disease relationship okay someone else yes um i have a question about gestational diabetes yes if you have gestational diabetes does that make you have a higher risk later on in life of developing type 2 diabetes? Good question. So the question was, if you have gestational diabetes, remember that's why you're pregnant, is your risk for type 2 diabetes greater? Um, 
I've seen both ways. Um, what I would say is most people would say, yes, your risk is greater, but it's usually just at that period of time. Your risk, um, to, in my mind, what I see in patients isn't that everyone who has gestational diabetes has type 2 diabetes. What I often see is someone who has a very unhealthy eating pattern and exercise while pregnant. Well, when they get older, it probably isn't going to get any better, so it can lead to that. Um, but it's the baby's impact that's causing the gestational diabetes, not often what the mom is doing. Um, so certainly with um, pregnancy, you would want to make sure you're following a similar diabetic type diet, limiting carbohydrates, exercising as, as recommended. But it doesn't mean you're going to get type 2 afterwards. If you continue eating unhealthy, if you continue with a higher weight um, status, your chances can be higher. But overall, it doesn't mean that you will. Okay, good question, though. All right, um, cholesterol. So this will talk a little bit here about cholesterol. Um, so what does it mean to have hyperlipidemia? Um, to break that down, that means high lipid levels that's cholesterol and triglycerides some of these things you may have heard in the media or just in your doctor's office um, so that means high cholesterol um, cholesterol is needed for a lot of our functions we actually produce it in our body by our liver but we also can ingest it in certain foods um, so foods that would have high cholesterol really come from any animal source high fat dairy high fat meat high fat you name it, animal source, coconut oil, that type of thing is going to have cholesterol in it. Um, so one, we do need it. Two, we often get too much of it in our diet. Um, so large amounts of cholesterol can cause that blockage. So remember, if we have the blockage, if we have the water hose that's kinked, that impacts blood flow, that impacts heart disease here. Okay. Um, high cholesterol can be a risk factor, heart, or heart attack, peripheral artery, artery disease, and then stroke as well. So Cholesterol is one thing that it's a great um, indicator for just heart health and being healthy in general. But um, as I go to this next slide, we're going to break these down and then I'll talk you through some of the latest research on this because this is in the research a lot lately and it's um, what we were once told and once educated on is now a little different. So we do have two different types of cholesterol. For any of you who have lab values from a physician or you've heard of this, we have HDL, which I think of high should be good cholesterol. Um, this is what's going to help transport the cholesterol back to the liver. Um, we want that. It helps to clear out the blood vessels. But LDL is what most people is often high in, and that's the bad cholesterol. Um, this transports cholesterol to the arteries. If we have an artery and it's blocked by cholesterol, think about the blood flow there. It's just not getting through as quickly. Um, so in order to change this, we want to make sure we adapt a heart healthy, low fat, high fiber diet and include exercise. But I will tell you that the more and more, probably in the past five years of research, we used to say that high cholesterol foods, so you think of eggs, you think of meats, you think of high fat dairy, high fat animal products. We used to think that dietary cholesterol, so food that has cholesterol, was linked to our lipid cholesterol, so hyperlipidemia. And so we were told, don't eat eggs, cut out all red meats, don't eat any meats at all. Some people went vegetarian. And what we're still finding, though, is those patients still have high cholesterol, the bad cholesterol. Um, so it's either a genetic thing, which we see, I see over and over, or it's lifestyle in general. So with my patients, those who just lose a little bit of weight, those who start exercising, we see the cholesterol go down. I have vegetarian patients who don't eat any animal products and their cholesterol is still high. It's a genetic thing. When you ask them, yeah, my dad has really high cholesterol. So um, what we were once told was to not eat any of these foods. We can still benefit from them, but we have to have just a healthy eating pattern in general. So if you don't exercise, if you eat high fat foods all the time, if you have um, unhealthy patterns, then yeah, that can impact your cholesterol. But if you eat really well, if you exercise, if your mom or dad or family member has high cholesterol, chances are you may still have high cholesterol and you still have to treat it. We still have to look at um, working with a physician on that, but it doesn't mean you're doing something wrong with your eating patterns. And I just want to emphasize that a little bit more. Um, Foods to lower cholesterol, this brings up the point here. So we talked about plaque building up in the arteries. 
if we're seeking ways to lower cholesterol, so maybe you have high cholesterol, maybe you feel like you're eating well, but trying to do a little bit better, I would always encourage my patients to add more soluble fiber rich foods. Oatmeal being one of those, fruits, vegetables, um, our beans, nuts, those are gonna be great ways to add fiber, which fiber pulls out cholesterol a little bit, helps recirculate or excrete it, and that helps to lower the, the pressure in our arteries too. So soluble fiber is one of those things I would always recommend for someone who has high cholesterol, regardless if it's genetic or if it's just diet and lifestyle influenced. Is that confusing on cholesterol? I know it's different than what may, some people may have heard, but that's what, um, if you look at a lot of latest research, that's what they're showing now. Okay, questions on heart disease, yes. If you don't eat a lot of fish, artificial supplements, good. Good question. So if you don't eat a lot of fish, don't cook a lot of fish, should we have a supplement? Um, you know, with any type of supplement, I wouldn't recommend it unless there's a family risk or you know for sure you're deficient in vitamin D or iron or that type of thing. But with fish oil, that's one of those things. Some people love fish and some people hate fish. Um, so I would try to get alternative sources of food if we can. That being flaxseed, walnuts, um, any of our oils are great sources of those omega-3s. Um, but a fish oil supplement isn't terrible to choose. A lot of my patients are on that to help with some cholesterol management if it's genetically linked. Um, so I'm not opposed to it at all. I just... Just make sure you know that, okay, just because I have a point increase in cholesterol, I'm taking it. You know, try to eat fish if you can. We absorb a whole lot more of that better from food than we do supplements. But it's something that I would not discount if you feel like, look, I just don't want to eat fish. I hate walnuts. I hate flaxseed. Um, it's fine to do as well. Okay? When you said flaxseed, it reminded me about chia seeds. Yes. Okay, so I have been eating chia seeds mixed with my yogurt. Yeah. My boss was telling me it's they're good for your system. It, so I guess I believe her, but yeah. could, would you have Sure. Some? So the question was just chia seeds yeah. in general. Is it good? Is it not? Um, you know, we have different fads that we go through, right? You know, when I grew up, it was the chia pets that grew on the oh, little, yeah. you know, and it's the same type thing. Now we're seeing it in a food form. It's quinoa was the same thing. That was never in existence. It's always been around, but now it's popular. Um, so for chia seeds, yes, they do provide um, a decent benefit, a little bit of the fat, some protein, some fiber as well. So if you like them, they're great to consume. Um, but with anything, moderation is key. So I wouldn't go crazy with flaxseed and everything, chia seeds and everything, um, because too much of anything can be a bad thing. But they're fine to choose if you like them. Yes. On the package, it said like daily intake, like one tablespoon. Yeah, it's very good. That's all I eat. And that's fine. Okay. That and it's it's not like you would eat half a cup. Right. 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 Another question. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, so gastrointestinal diseases. We'll go through this um, fairly quickly. Um, so what are gastrointestinal um, issues? This. I mean, I can I could talk about this every day. People think, oh my gosh, how do you talk about diarrhea, constipation, and those types of things? Um, but if you think about food and nutrition, you've got to be in tune with that and what's going on. Um, so this kind of encompasses our gastrointestinal diseases, um, and these can be caused by many different things. It can be caused by diet. It can be caused by too much of one thing. If we're lactose intolerant and we're eating a lot of dairy, that can be a factor. Um, not feeling comfortable going to the bathroom in public or where we are. Um, using too many laxatives, certain medications, stress, anxiety, all these can, can impact our gastrointestinal system. So how do we work on that? Um, so if we do feel more constipated, and this can be in any population that, that I see, um, this is what we want to look at is increasing fiber, but increasing it slowly. So if we eat a lot at one time, remember fiber bulks our stool. And so if it bulks our stool, we're already having a hard time going. We don't want to add too much at one time. So we want to add it slowly over time. And these are many things that we've talked about in the diabetic piece. Whole grains, fruits, vegetables, lots of that. Anytime we increase fiber, I would always recommend from food versus supplement. Supplement can be needed um, if, we, if it's necessary or medically necessary, but food first, 
If we do increase fiber, make sure you're always drinking plenty of water, at least 64 ounces of water per day. If we add fiber in, but no water comes in, it's just going to sit there. So we want to make sure we have enough water going in. Um, and here again, talk with your doctor about calcium or iron supplement. Iron in particular can cause more constipation, calcium as well. So we want to make sure we're not doing anything outside of just food that would be causing them to do that. Okay. Um, these are high fiber foods here too. Some of these, like I said, we've already talked about um, your berries, your nuts, your seeds, your beans. Those are all great things to be incorporating if we need to do that. Um, diarrhea is another thing too. Hopefully doesn't happen all the time, but it can for some people. Um, and it's not so much as what we're eating. Sometimes stress can cause this. Sometimes just different environments. So I always think of the brat diet here. So this is bananas, rice, apples or applesauce, and toast are great for someone who has diarrhea. Think of family members, kids, yourself, that type of thing. So we certainly want to decrease fiber, fat, lactose, sugars, all that can cause more of what I term dumping syndrome. It can cause a little bit more of that um, diarrhea to occur. Um, so you can see this as well. I threw in yogurt here for just probiotics. If we're constantly going to the bathroom, we have lots of little microflora and um, bacteria in our gut that gets wiped clean. And so if we don't have any probiotics coming back in to replenish that, we may continue just to have this dumping syndrome going on. So yogurt would be a great thing that we could add here for probiotics. Yes. It always says toast. Yes. Why not just regular bread? Bread is fine too. Um, but if we think of toast, sometimes it's a little easier to eat, um, to swallow in particular, and sometimes it's a little bit more tolerable if we're um, thinking about kids, family members, that type of thing. Okay. Um, irritable bowel syndrome is, I kind of laugh about this a little bit because it's kind of this catch-all. A lot of my patients that come to me and complain of stomach issues with maybe stress or maybe stomach issues in the morning or diarrhea, constipation, it's back and forth. Um, they usually get diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. It's a catch-all for a lot of um, GI physicians because when they do a scope, there's really nothing wrong. It all looks good. There's nothing blocking. There's no specific um, disease process, but it, it's kind of this just lumped together. Um, so what this is, is the body really can't digest or absorb food. It can be diarrhea or constipation or alternating. Um, so what I like to focus on here is small meals or snacks, enough fluids, especially if we're having a really constipation. We want more fiber and more fluid. Um, lots of probiotics and prebiotics. So if we look at these here, um, and I'll, you'll all get these slides too. I'll send them out. Um, prebiotics are what feed the probiotics. We hear a lot about probiotics. Uh, they're good for us. We need them. They're in yogurts. But I think a lot of times we forget about what feeds those as well. Um, so we need probiotics, but the prebiotics, um, good sources here, chicory root, um, artichoke, dandelions, and then food you'll actually eat, um, garlic, leeks, onions, whole wheat, fruits, vegetables, and legumes. So those are all great for prebiotic fuel. Um, recommended foods for IBS, you'll kind of see these here again too. <coughs> like I mentioned, I'll send you these slides so you have them. Um, questions on gastrointestinal issues? Okay, it's okay to ask too. <laughs> I talk about it all the time, so it really Do doesn't bother me. I would recommend a low FODMAP diet. Yeah, so she asked a um, low FODMAP diet. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is usually for some food sensitivities or someone who's struggling with irritable bowel syndrome. Um, FODMAP is, is a, without going into a lot of detail, it tries to classify different types of our higher um, risk foods or foods that become a little bit more intolerable. So you may find lactose on there. You may find things like our um, artificial sweeteners on there. So I work with some patients on that as well. It just has to be someone who's really willing to follow it and follow it strictly and then try to do what we call an elimination <coughs> diet and then reincorporate some of those foods back in to really figure out. So it's not to figure out if there's an allergy. It's not to figure out um, anything particular for allergens. It's more of just sensitivities, what's able to be tolerated, what's not. So yes, we can certainly, I certainly work on that with students as well. Okay. All right, lastly, we're gonna um, swing through eating disorders here. 
This is one, like I said, many of you go, okay, well, I can't really relate to this as much, but hopefully there'll be some tips in here. If you do see family members, friends, coworkers that are exhibiting some of this, you'll know what to say or how to, to um, incorporate it. Um, so we do have three different types of eating disorders. There's, these are up here. I'm going to explain each one, but really when I think about eating disorders and, and classically in a clinical setting, it's never really a classic bulimia, anorexic, binge eater, usually they end up being just disordered patterns. So they may have started out restricting, then they led to overeating, now they're a binge eater and aren't restricting at all. So they overlap a lot, although science and, and the internet wants us to think we fit in these classifications. Um, but regardless, some common symptoms here are preoccupation with food, weighing, measuring, obsessing over that. Um, restriction of certain foods, so I don't eat sweets because this, and it's just constantly restricting. Um, not feeling comfortable eating around others, skipping meals, weight fluctuation, so if you see really low and then really high back and forth. Um, menstrual irregularity, so lack of menstrual cycle. If any of you have kids, females in particular, if they're lacking menstrual cycle, that can often mean too low body fat. So we need estrogen and body fat go hand in hand. So if we don't have body fat, estrogen isn't produced. So um, that's a big classic sign of um, eating concerns or just too low body fat, not getting enough. Difficulty concentrating, feeling cold. So always cold when everyone else is fairly comfortable. Um, immune function, so always sick. And then even to um, dry skin, hair, nails. Um, you'll notice like very thin hair on the arms, that type of thing. We're going to see that in more of an under-fueled patient. Um, so binge eating disorder. So some of this you can go, gosh, well, sometimes that's me. Um, but the classification here is really where it happens multiple times and um, more than once per week over three months. Um, this is eating very rapidly, eating a large amount to where you feel uncomfortably full. If I think about this, sometimes I'm like, oh gosh, okay, well, I kind of overate last night. But this would really be that feeling out of control. So not even realizing how much we ate, um, eating alone, out of embarrassment, feeling guilty afterwards, um, having that distress afterwards. So really it's not only what we ate, but the environment and our mental thoughts after that as well. Um, the one thing with binge eating disorder that is different from bulimia is there's no compensatory behaviors, meaning there's usually no laxative use, there's no purging, there's no over-exercising. These types of patients are usually normal weight, maybe a little bit overweight. There's no um, mechanism to get rid of the food after they're eating here. Um, so this may be someone who's gaining weight without you seeing them eating any differently. Um, bulimia here, so this is a little bit of this kind of cycle, so we have cravings, we end up overeating, we purge or we overexercise, um, overexercising <coughs> being more than two hours a day, seven days a week, um, shame and disgust, strict dieting, purging here too could be a form of laxative use, so if you see someone doing more of that as well. Um, lots of laxatives too can cause a lot of gastrointestinal distress. So if we're constantly giving ourselves medication to go to the bathroom, when we really do need to go to the bathroom, those muscles haven't had to work themselves. They've just been given information or medication to do so. So it makes it a little bit more challenging. And then we rely on the laxatives again to go because we feel uncomfortable. And that's kind of a cycle we go through. Um, so recurring to frequent episodes of binge eating, usually large amounts, and then we're compensating with purging, fasting, excessive exercise, um, dental problems, as you can imagine here, constant purging, um, also pH imbalance, also electrolyte imbalance. So when we do lab values on these types of patients, I'll see um, sodium and potassium being off a little bit too because they're losing a lot of those electrolytes. Um, calluses on the back of hands or knuckles, so from that purging piece, you may notice that. Um, anorexia nervosa, so this is the classic not eating, restricting, that type of thing. Um, so you'll see dramatic weight loss here. Um, lots of pursuit of thinness, so never feeling satisfied with losing 5 pounds. Now it's, I want to lose 10 pounds, now it's 20, and it's on and on. Um, harder to maintain a normal healthy weight really a big distortion of body image. So they may see themselves as being this big when they're really only this big. Um, so it's a lot of psychological piece here again. Now fear of gaining weight, only healthy foods. 
Um, uh, one that's not on here that I see over and over in students is not a classic eating disorder, but it's called ortho, um, orthorexia. And orthorexia really is just a healthy obsession with food that leads to disordered eating patterns. And so I started seeing this probably in the past three to four years over and over um, with a ketogenic diet, with um, Whole30, they started eating really, really healthy and now can't get out of that. And then there's this obsession with food, it starts developing similar patterns to this. Um, so I can't eat anything outside of this little box and it is more of a disordered eating pattern. Um, and eventually, if it's not already a DSM criteria, it, it will be soon. Um, so preoccupation with food labels, here again, very cold, so they're dressing in layers often. Um, so health consequences, we've talked about the cardiovascular system. We've talked about a little bit of the GI distress here, um, but neurological too. So if we're not fueling our body, we can't get the energy to our brain. Cardiovascular, our heart needs fuel to pump. And so what I tell students a lot is, Think of your body as a house, and um, different things will start to shut off if we have no energy coming in. We can't keep all the lights on. So if menstrual cycle is one of those we don't need, that will shut off. If my temperature is too high, we can lower that, and that'll, that room will turn the light off. Eventually, we get to the heart, and we don't have enough energy for the heart to pump, and that turns off too. So this can be a very deadly disease if we really think about the complications. Um, endocrine being the hormone level here again, so lack of body fat, lack of estrogen, and we're seeing some changes there. And this just kind of goes through a little bit of this. Okay, so how do you help a loved one? This is really where I wanted to get to more than anything. Um, what I always suggest, and I just had a um, coworker ask me this today, and I said, always talk to the person as I'm concerned about you. I want to help you. If you tell them you're eating this, you're doing that, you look like this, it really doesn't <coughs> make a difference and they're not going to help want to seek help and change. Um, so always be on that, I'm concerned, I want to help you. Um, remove that potential stigma, um, be caring, encourage them to seek a therapist, encourage them to see a dietitian, encourage them to see a doctor. They're not always going to be ready to do that. And so you have to accept that and know that until they're ready, they're not going to want to make a change and recovery won't be successful. Um, but always encouraging them to, them to see at least one of those components would be a great way to start here. Okay. Um, the National Eating Disorder Awareness Week and their website is a great website to go to if you have specific concerns or needs about eating disorder patients. Okay, several resources here, but we have about five minutes for question, answer, anything that you didn't ask or eating disorder wise, um, and these will be on your, your slide as well, but I'll leave them up here. Yes? Where does gout fall in? Gout. Um, you know, it's diet related, sure. Um, I wouldn't say it's cardiovascular, it's more of just sometimes if you have a family history of it, you're a little bit more prone to it, but it's certainly diet related. Um, so gout is a buildup of uric acid, and usually it builds up in our joints, so elbows, ankles, those areas, um, wrists. Um, and so usually what we find is people with a very high uh, or a diet high in protein or animal protein in particular have a higher risk for that. Um, I see it in students a lot, and I see it in, in older patients a lot. So it's not limited to certain age groups, but it is something that I would say if you know you're more prone to it or have had it in the past, you certainly have to be proactive with what you're eating. But for the general population, eating a low, a diet low in animal products, most people aren't going to have gout just because there's no real genetic component or there's just no risk factor there. So it's not something that I would say is, it is treatable, yes, but you just have to be able to manage it and know that if you're more prone to it, we've got to look at the animal fat or animal protein. Question? Yes. Do you have any suggestion on acid reflux? How do you know for that? Yes, so acid reflux, and I should have included that one. That's a very popular one. Um, so one with acid reflux, you have to think about we have our esophagus, and then there's like a little flap that sits above our stomach. And so when we put something in and it sits in the stomach, it pushes up a lot for a lot of people with acid reflux, and that causes some chest burning, that causes the burping, that causes that burning feeling in the throat. Um, so a few things with this, I would always eat small meals regularly, so not a lot at once. If we put a lot in, 
The stomach goes out and it's pushing pressure on that little flap. Um, if we eat and then lie down, just think of gravity, that flap is a lot more prone to be open here. So we want to eat, wait at least two to three hours before we lay down or rest at that time. Um, high acidic foods too. So when we have a lot of acid, our stomach is naturally being churned with acid to break down all these foods. So if we add a lot of acid in our foods, plus the acid that's in our stomach, that can cause some discomfort. So high acidic foods would be any of our citrus, um, tomato, tomato juice, tomato products are gonna be high in acid. And really a lot of our caffeine can cause more acid reflux too. So coffee, caffeinated beverages, that type of thing um, can be triggering for <coughs> acid reflux. Other questions? All right. Well, I'm happy to answer any afterwards, too, if you have those questions. Next week, we'll focus on nutrition through the life cycle. I'm really excited about that because we'll start at infant and go all the way through adult. Um, and then we'll have one specifically on healthy aging. So older adults, um, not it's not necessarily meant to, as I was putting it together, it's like this is not meant for geriatric 90 plus patients it's really meant for just healthy aging and how to age healthfully um, so this next presentation will cover all of the aging span but it'll really focus on kids teens picky eaters how to how to work through that as well so i think that'll be a fun one hopefully you'll have a lot of questions about as well okay all right thank you, thank you. you're welcome